Okay, g'day all. Welcome to another video. Uh, today we're talking about timing in Direct2D. So what I want to point out is that um, desktop and laptop computers, pretty much all computing devices, uh, they all run at different speeds. So unless we're really careful, our animations are going to run at different speeds too. They'll be slow on slow machines and fast on fast ones. So that's no good. What we really want to do is uh, have them run at the same speed, or apparently the same speed on every machine. Uh, so one idea that's going to give us um, pretty much the same speed on every machine is syncing with the refresh rate of the monitor. Uh, monitors refresh themselves at about 60 times per second. Uh, other monitors refresh themselves at 100 times per second. Uh, but generally it's about 60, so we can actually time our frames with the monitor. Uh, but there's trouble. If we accidentally miss a frame, uh, our frame rate will drop back to 30 frames per second. So yeah, that mightn't be ideal for us. We're going to have to do a little bit more than just sync with the refresh rate, um, but we will be we will be syncing with the refresh rate as well automatically. Um, what we really want to do is scale by the elapsed seconds, so we can actually measure how many seconds have elapsed since calls to update and render. So you'll remember in our game loop we're calling these two functions update and render over and over again, and what we can do is um, read how many seconds have passed. So often what we do or what we'll read is going to be about 1 60th of a second or 0 0.016666 uh, repeating and this is because we're syncing with the monitor and like I said the monitor refreshes itself 60 times a second uh, so that'll give us a frame rate of about 60 frames a second uh, but every now and again if we miss the monitor's refresh rate and we drop back to 30 frames per second the thing is we want the animation to double the movement between frames so this is really the key to creating programs that run at the same speed no matter what the hardware is. Uh, or programs that look like they're running at the same speed no matter what the hardware is. Uh, it all comes down to frame skipping. Uh, so this is it just here. This is a couple of uh, examples. This top one here will be a fast computer that can run four frames. And this lower example down here is a slower computer that can only do two frames in the same amount of time. Uh, but the important thing to see is that even though the fast computer runs four frames and it moves the ball from the left hand side of the screen to the right hand side of the screen, what we can do is a little calculation and the slower computer can figure out where the ball would be at the same amount of time. So at 0 0.05 seconds, uh, the slower computer's only displayed two frames, but it can move the ball to exactly the same place. So the animation is going to look a little bit choppier on the slow computer but it's essentially going to be running at the same speed. That's really what we're talking about here today. Um, okay, so we're going to be talking about uh, reading the uh, high precision timer, HP timer, and I'm just going to assume that it's clock cycles that we're reading from the CPU. Um, it probably won't be, or it mightn't be, it's up to the OS, uh, whatever it chooses to use as the highest precision timer it can find. Uh, but usually we'll um, just talk about clock cycles, even though it might literally be clock cycles. Um, okay, so this is the Windows function here that we use to read the number of clock cycles of the CPU, or the number of ticks in whatever time on Windows is uh, selected. Um, query performance counter it's called, uh, and it returns to us by populating this uh, pointer just here. So we got this uh, long integer parameter that's a pointer, and this function is going to populate that with the number of ticks in the timer. Um, if query performance counter is not available, if there's no performance counter available in the system, then you'll get uh, false back from this function. Um, that won't happen, so uh, we'll just assume it's going to work. Um, you could do a little safety check in there if you wanted to. Um, it's a Windows function, system function, so you want to include the Windows header, windows.h. And long integer is just a 64-bit integer. Yeah, we'll actually convert this to a long long, which is, um, yeah, you can convert a long integer to a long long by calling the quad method or property. We'll have a look in a minute. Um, the other thing that we need is the performance frequency. So the, the counter is ticking by at some really, really, you know, high precision rate, something like 3 billion times a second. Um, you need to know how fast it's counting in order to convert the number to seconds so that we can use it in our program. And this function, query performance frequency, gives us the frequency in seconds. So then all we've got to do is just divide the count by the frequency and hey presto, we've got ourselves seconds. Um, once again, this is going to populate this long integer value that we pass here as a parameter. 
Yeah, and the, the other thing is that you only need to call query performance frequency once in your program since that's not going to change. Um, I didn't mention, but I think, um, I think query performance counter will give you the ticks that have elapsed since the computer was booted up. I think that's what the number is, I think. Anyway, it's not, it's not really important since we'll be um, figuring it all out relative to some start time. Uh, okay, so we're going to start. Uh, we're going to start coding now. Let me just escape out of um, LibreOffice, and uh, what we're going to do is add a new class called HP Timer. Um, you wouldn't have to do this with a class, but uh, let's just do it anyway. So I'm just going to put all of my code for HP Timer into a header because I think it's simple enough uh, to include in a single header, all in line, and we don't really need to do anything. Um, else in a CPP file. So what I want you to do is uh, come over to our project. Uh, we might just do a little bit of tidying first. Um, I'll get rid of this Y speed stuff. Actually before I do, I'll just run it so that you can see where we were up to last time. Uh, we had a bouncing ball and a little guy kicking in the corner. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> there we go. So, so we actually don't need these little guys kicking or the bouncing ball, so I'll just get rid of all of that code before we go any further. Um, because we're about to make better animation than that. Would you believe it? <laughs> uh, let me just uh, delete this. And I might draw one, one, one frame. Yeah, I'll make the guy go across the screen. So it'll be frame zero. Um, this, I think, uh, X position. Something like that. Um, we'll define X position over here as a float. And I'll set it up in the load method. Uh, X position equals zero point zero f. And down here in update, we'll say um, I found a bug before as well when I was. Well, I think I think we'll come to it in a minute. There's there's a bug in the um, game controller class. Um, what are we doing? So X position, whenever we call update, plus equals 1.0F, and if X position is ever greater than 800, then um, X position minus equals 800.0F. Okay, so all I want to do is just animate one of our little um, kicking frames uh, going across the screen from left to right. Let's have a look. Okay, there he is. So that's super hard to see. What I might do is uh, just fix our little image here so that it's easy to see on the dark blue background. I'll just draw a white blob. Um, what a terrible, terrible set of uh, sprites. Okay, so if I just make it a big white blob, something like that. I might make it a jagged edged white blob, a sharp edged white blob. And overwrite and close, discard. I say discard. I mean, really discard. Thank you. Um, okay, so you can. Yeah, there we go. So you can see better now that there's a blob going from the left hand side to the right hand side of the screen. But the thing is that this is not going to run at the same speed. If your computer's really, really slow, it might run across the screen at half this speed. And if your computer's really, really fast, or you've got a frame rate of, say, 100 uh, times a second that your monitor's refreshing, because we're waiting for the VSync. Um, the little blob might run across the screen at 100 frames a second. Yeah, so what we want is we want it to go exactly the same speed no matter what. And uh, we'll do it with this HP timer class. So I'll add my new class. Uh, right click on your project and come down to add. New item. It's going to be a header. And we'll type HP timer for Harry Potter. <laughs> Not really. Uh, pragma once. Okay, there's my HP timer class. I think I've actually typed all this stuff out already, so I might not um, bother typing it out again. Yeah, I did. Okay, so I'll just copy this. Uh, we will do coding at the end where we actually implement the timer in the um, in the program as it stands, but for now I'll just use copy. Um, so the member uh, variables for HP timer, this is just what I selected. You could probably think of a whole bunch more if you wanted, but they're all long, long. They're 64-bit integers, and start time is the time that it's a time stamp um, that we called reset. Yeah, so that's the last time we reset the timer. Um, that for us is going to be the zero time. 
Uh, last call to update and current call to update will be a little bit confusing before we have a look at time delta. But what we want to do is calculate the difference between two calls to update, right? So the last call to update and the current call to update. Um, we want to know how many ticks have elapsed between those two. Uh, so we need two timestamps there. Last call to update is the previous call to update's timestamp. And current call to update is whatever the current call to update gave us as a timestamp. And finally, we also need uh, frequency, yeah, the number of ticks per second of the high precision timer that we're using. Okay, so, so the uh, constructor is nice and easy. All we've got to do is uh, set the frequency with a call to uh, query performance frequency and then call reset. Um, so you'll notice just here, the um, converting a long integer into a long long is just a matter of calling this uh, or using this quad part. Uh, property of the long integer. Good stuff. Something's happened to all my tabbing. Makes me sad. Uh, I think my tabbing makes everyone sad. <laughs> all right, so that's the constructor. Uh, reset. All right, so the reset function is nice and easy as well. All we want to do is set all of our timestamps to the current time. And that's what this function just here does. So large integer, once again, and uh, we pass that to query performance counter with uh, ampersand t there, taking its address so that it can populate that large integer. And then we just use that timestamp, whatever, you know, whatever time that happens to be. And we set uh, start time, current call to update and last call to update to exactly that value. I was going to say something else. Oh yeah, just here, if you want to say, um, if, if, if that doesn't work out, something like this, you know, you could, you could do this if you want and uh, just make an error check there to see if there is actually a performance counter. And I mean, if there's not, then you could just show a message box, you know, it's not, it's not working. Something like, um, it's not working. Maybe bro at the end, and full stop. <laughs> yeah, but this would be where you test if, um, if it all goes well or not. Error checking. I'm not going to bother because I think, you know, all computers pretty much have a performance counter of some type. Okay, next function. Okay, the update method. So just like the level class, um, we want to update our timer just so that it stays nice and current. Uh, all the update method actually does is um, calls query performance counter and saves that to current call to update as a timestamp. Uh, it also copies whatever the current call to update was to the last call to update so that later on we can subtract one from the other and figure out the difference or the time delta value. Okay, that's the update method. We'll see how to use uh, all of this in just a second. If it's if it's confusing, don't worry. Uh, get time total. Okay, so these are two time functions that I decided to include. These are two probably the most common uh, time functions that you'll use. Uh, time total. Uh, I just decided more or less arbitrarily that this would be the time since reset was called. Yeah, so in the constructor, it calls reset immediately. Uh, time total there would be zero. And also, if you call reset whenever you start a level or whatever, then um, yeah, time total will reflect that. So time total is the, um, the number of uh, seconds that have elapsed since reset was called. And this right here is the calculation to give you seconds. Yeah, so you just divide whatever your ticks are by the frequency. Yeah, so time total, total is the current call to update minus the start time. You divide that difference by the frequency and you'll get yourself seconds. Uh, I'm also using doubles, as you might have noticed. Uh, you could use floats if you want. It makes no real difference. Um, yeah, if you want a little bit of a performance increase, maybe you want to use floats. I don't think in this instance it's really going to make uh, any difference at all. So we might as well get um, as precise as we can. All right, and time delta. Okay, so time delta is, uh, well, the difference in time, really. That's what delta means. Little triangle, I think they draw it as. Uh, time delta is the difference between two calls to update. So we're going to be running around in our in our game, and every time update is called, um, we want to know what the distance there is between the two. So this is this is basically going to be the time between frames. Yeah, we need to know the amount of time that's elapsed between the last frame because we want to know how far to move our objects along their path. Um, yeah, that's it's pretty much uh, how you deal with uh, automatic frame skipping. Um, so we can compute this time delta value here by subtracting last call to update from current call to update. Yeah, so now all of this should probably make sense um, why we copied current call to update to last call to update. 
I really think I could have chosen better names. Uh, anyway, um, once again, we divide whatever that difference is by frequency, and that's going to give us the answer in seconds. Now, hopefully about 0 0.016666, hopefully about 60 frames a second is what we'll be uh, running at. Okay, so that's about all that we had to do there uh, for implementing the class, but now we want to uh, actually add it to our program. So if I just hit run and make sure I've made no mistakes in my copying. Okay, we're all good so far. We've got our stupid little blob running across the screen. Um, the next thing that I want to do is uh, include an instance of one of these HP timers. So I might include it in the game controller since I want to make this as automatic as possible. You know, I don't want to have to call um, update in the timer class every level I make. Um, it's just, I don't know, it's not, a, it's not a very neat way to do it. So I might just um, include one in the game controller and do it all automatically. HP timer. Okay, so we're going to have to include the header, HP timer. Okay, good stuff. And then I better declare this in my game controller.cpp file. So we'll go to the top of that. And um, we get rid of static, and we'll go uh, game controller. Okay, good stuff. That's nice and declared. And what I want to do is call HP timer update just before calling the levels update function. So it's the game controller that actually calls the levels update and render. And just before it calls the levels update function, I want it to update the timer so that the levels got um, the most up-to-date time it can. So if we come down here to game controllers update method, uh, we can say HP timer, I put a space in there for HP timer update. Good stuff. And then the other thing that I want to do is um, add two parameters to the levels update method. I want to pass time total and time delta, um, just so that the levels automatically have, well, not, not really automatically since we're <laughs> coding it all up. Uh, they've automatically got the um, most current time. So we'll say get time total. And the other parameter will be uh, HP timer um, get time delta. Okay, so at the moment, uh, level update function doesn't actually take any parameters, so we better change that. We'll come over to game level. This is our abstract parent class, and we'll add two doubles. Uh, HP, well, no, settle down. Um, time total and double time delta. After all this work, it's going to pretty much look like exactly the same program, <laughs> uh, but it won't be the same program. All right, game level.cpp doesn't need to change, but uh, level one does. So our update function has to take two parameters in level one.h, um, and in level one.cpp, we've got to pass those two parameters as well. Okay, so if I hit run, we should have something. I think the bug. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah, there's the bug. Bug. Um, okay, so what I actually forgot to do was. Um, in the game controller, I made this init function somewhere, just here, but we never actually called it. Yeah, we never actually called it. So, well, we better call it somewhere. Where, where does the game controller actually... Where did I actually say that a, 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 a new game controller should be um, here, I think? I don't think I did. So, HP... Uh, timer equals new HP timer. I never actually called the constructor, so that was silly. But I think even if I run it now, we'll get the same error. Yeah, because the uh, game controller doesn't actually um, run the init method. So if you come over to main, oh goodness, I hate going through this main thing. Uh, I think we want to init the uh, game controller somewhere about uh, just before we load the first level. So I'll say here, uh, game controller init. Yeah, pretty silly of me not to actually call the init function. Okay, there we go. So we've got our little blob running across the screen again. We've fixed that uh, bug of not calling init. But the thing is, um, we want to scale the blob's movement by this time delta value. So if now we multiply the movement of our blob, this x position uh, variable, uh, by time delta, and I hit play, well, it's almost stopped. But... 
it'll be almost stopped on everyone's machine. Yeah, so this will run at the same speed regardless of your machine because we're scaling by the number of seconds. Um, let's just make it a bit quicker. We'll go to about 20. Okay, there we go. Nice. Nice. Good program. Okay, so it doesn't look very impressive, but we're getting somewhere, I think. Um, what I also want to mention, and something that I probably should have done originally, is that uh, all of our animations, this draw method just here for sprites, um, it takes integer parameters, and I think it would be better, or it would give us the opportunity to make smoother uh, animations if we change that to float. So I might do that now. Um, we change that to float, and we also change uh, interpolation mode from nearest neighbor to linear. Um, it's going to run a little bit slower, but it won't be noticeable. So if, you, if you're really after some performance, change that back to nearest neighbor. Um, the draw method in sprite sheet takes floats. Okay, so we better find sprite sheet.h. Yeah, just here. I think this will be better in the end. Um, this will mean that you can render a, uh, a sprite at, you know, halfway between a pixel instead of having to render them always on pixels. Yeah, it looks smoother to me. I don't know if you can tell. It's quite small. Eventually, we'll get into drawing some fat graphics, and that's going to um, hopefully make things easier to see. If I speed it up a little bit, let's just come over here. If I speed it up a little bit, maybe it'll be more exciting. No. <laughs> it's not a bit. Not a bit. Uh, well, kind of. Let's just go up to, say, 200. Yeah, it's getting somewhere now. Um, okay, yeah, but the point is that that's going to go across the screen at the same speed regardless of the performance of your computer, which is pretty important, really, and quite cool. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Next time, I think we might have a bit of a look at uh, timing frames in animations because that's a little bit fiddly. It's It uses that same timer class, but it's a little bit fiddly. Uh, or we could look at fat graphics, like big pixelated graphics that you see so so often in uh, indie games nowadays. Anyway, that's it. I've got a Patreon and a Facebook page. If you like what I'm doing here, uh, you can head on over there. There's uh, going to be links in the video description. And have a good one. Adios.